This is my garden. And this is Bob. In this video, we're going to simulate a very simple evolutionary system. The goal is not to learn about some crazy new phenomenon, but rather to develop a solid understanding of the basic, bare-bone processes of evolution. For that, we're going to need a replicator. A replicator is defined as an entity able to make copies of itself come into existence. Notice how I've chosen the word replicator deliberately. These entities don't reproduce, they replicate. To reproduce means to generate a new individual from your genetic information. To replicate is to create a copy of whatever state you're currently in. Besides, our little creatures don't even have genetic information, and so they're not even technically creatures. To be able to replicate, our Bob will bounce around the garden collecting these little magic pellets. After he has collected four pellets, he will create a new Bob. Now, if left unchecked, the Bobs will soon grow to a rather annoying amount, so we'll also give them a small chance to be disintegrated each frame. As you'll notice, there's not much evolution going on right now, and that's because we haven't fulfilled the second requirement for a system to be evolutionary. We need our bobs to have traits that make them better or worse at replicating. So, let's introduce the cast. First we'll have Antonio, the red replicator, and his distinctive trait will be that he's really fast. Then we have Cream, the cream-colored replicator, who will be able to absorb magic pellets from further away than the rest. Then Death, the black replicator, with a lower death chance than the others. And finally, to make things fair and more interesting, we'll also give Bob a special trait. We'll allow Bob to replicate with just three magic pellets instead of four. All is now set up, let's see how the garden evolves. Here on the side we'll track the number of replicators of each type over time. If you want to make any predictions, now's the time. I'll give you the exact numbers we're using if that makes it any easier. Got it? Alright, let's speed it up a bit. In the end, only creams were left. Did you get it right? Now, I've run the simulation a hundred times so that we can have a little bit more data, and the result was the same in 99 of them. In one, however, the creams went extinct really quickly, and Death, the black replicator, eventually outnumbered all the others and drove them to extinction. What we have seen here is this little population evolved by a process of selection. Selection refers to the fact that, in a particular environment, some replicators are more effective at replicating than others. These more effective replicators will tend to grow in numbers, while the less effective ones will tend to disappear. This selection process is not something I programmed specifically into our simulation. Nor is there anyone inside my computer doing the selecting. All we did was establish a simple rule about when a replicator was allowed to replicate, and then, the selection process emerged by itself. In fact, even if we wanted to stop the selection from happening, we're kind of powerless Error. against it, as it's also the case in many real-world scenarios. Notice also how I said that the most effective replicators will tend to grow. Just because they're more likely to replicate, that does not mean that they will. If we look at the data, there's actually a lot of variation in the way these populations evolved from identical starting conditions. It can be very tempting to look at one specific outcome and draw conclusions about which replicators are being more effective, when in reality the result we're looking at might be simply a matter of chance. Now, if you're anything like me, you're probably wondering, why? Why did the creams win? What makes them better? Let's look into this. When the total population is low, pellets normally spawn in empty space. 
That gives an advantage to faster replicators. Because they're faster, they will explore more empty areas and therefore run into more pellets. When the total population is high, however, pellets usually spawn inside the absorption radius of two or more replicators. When this happens, both creatures will try to absorb the pellet for themselves, with the closest creature exerting the strongest force and therefore claiming the pellet. But the strength of this force is calculated proportionally to the absorption radius of the creature. This means that if a pellet spawns between Antonio and Cream, it will most often be eaten by Cream, even in cases where Antonio is actually closer. Because of this, we expect Cream to be highly successful in crowded environments, while we expect Antonio to be more successful when populations are sparse. To test this out, let's run the simulation again, but reduce the amount of magic pellets we put out. This will ensure that the total population stays small. Let's see what happens. So it turns out I was only half right. By reducing the population size, we shifted the selection pressure from favoring Cream to favoring Antonio, as we had predicted. However, we also made Chance play a much bigger role. Because the population is now smaller, just one individual dying at an unfortunate time or failing to find enough magic pellets will have a much bigger effect on the final outcome. What these results mean is that our previous assumption that Cream is a more effective replicator needs an asterisk. Cream is a more effective replicator, not in general, but specifically in crowded environments. If we go back to our initial data, what is likely going on is that, in the beginning, selection pressures do not favor Cream. And it is only when the environment has shifted to a certain condition, in this case becoming crowded enough, that Creams become more effective than the rest at collecting magic pellets therefore replicate more, therefore become more numerous, and we will say that they are being selected. So, to recap, what did we learn? When we had a system of replicators with different traits, those replicators who were more effective became more populous through a process we have called selection. This selection was not something we designed, but rather just the outcome of some creatures replicating more than others. Which replicators were more effective depended on how well their traits matched the environment. This environment included the population of replicators itself, and was therefore constantly changing as the population evolved. Finally, we saw that the evolution of the population didn't depend only on selection, but also had an element of chance. This chance was more impactful in scenarios where the total population was lower. Earlier in the video, I showed you this screen, with the two requirements needed for a system to have evolution take place within it. I hope that this now makes more sense to you, and that you understand not only why they're necessary for evolution, but also that it would be impossible not to have evolution if these requirements were fulfilled. But the truth is, I lied a little bit. Despite what we've seen, there's something very concrete about these requirements which is wrong. I will amend this intentional tiny mistake in the next video. In the meanwhile, however, I encourage you to think about what the error may be and why. My hope is that this exercise of questioning assumptions, which are presented to you confidently and in an entertaining manner, will condition you to become more cautious about what kind of information you accept as true without more careful consideration. If you think you know what the mistake is, write it down in the comments. Take care.